Hey, this is John Reed. I have unceremoniously raided the MongoDB Palo Alto headquarters with Kelly Sturman from Mongo. How's it going? Great. It's good to have you here. You are the VP of Strategy and Marketing. Is that right? Uh, yes, VP of uh, Strategy and Product Marketing. At but you actually know a lot about data and data issues, and you're kind of actually a little bit obsessed with researching and learning about that stuff, which is what we're going to talk about. Okay. I spend a, yeah, I spend a couple hours every day uh, researching, reading things online, reading academic research. Um, before I got into this, uh, basically 20 years in the industry and databases, mostly in the technical role. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about security, because Mongo has been in the news a little bit. Uh, a little bit. And, and this is an opportunity to educate around how we need all to all be vigilant about security in different ways, which is what it comes down to. So we're going to get into that a little bit. But first, just tell me a little bit about, like, your latest obsessions with with data. I mean, you said some interesting things to me, like that you don't even consider Mongo a, MongoDB to be a NoSQL database, which is kind of shocking for certain people that want to categorize you as such. So, yeah, I think I mean, unfortunately, NoSQL uh, sort of became the other bucket, and lots of things went into it that maybe were 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 not had very little in common with one another. Yeah, the way I think about MongoDB. Um, is that uh, there are all these wonderful things about relational databases. I love a relational database. Like, there's no, I'm not here to uh, knock on the relational database. I'm not going to bash those people, huh? Um, uh, and the, there are great things like, you know, the notion of expressive query language and secondary indexes, strong consistency, and integrations with all those enterprise tools and standards that have been evolving over the past several decades. But people started building different kinds of databases you know, about 10 years ago, and mostly because they were running into some limitations with the relational database. Right. And they started focusing on flexibility of data model and scalability and performance and being always on all over the world. But they kind of gave up all those great things about relational databases. And what I think is so powerful about MongoDB is it gives you the best of both worlds. It preserves the virtues of the relational database, but gives you the scalability and flexibility and always on abilities of things we think of as all right, folks, so that was your MongoDB plug. Uh, but you <laughs> So that's, that's why you guys are great, um, according to, to you. Uh, but, but no, it, it does make sense. Um, but, but actually, you've been, you've been actually trying to sort through this from the perspective of, of customers as well who are trying to make sense of this exploding universe of concepts, right? I mean, you're dealing with everything from the phenomenon of container technology to, to graph databases to streaming data. Those are all things you've been looking at. Can you maybe start peeling those back a little bit, help us to understand what that's all about? Sure. Um, yeah, f for me, uh, MongoDB is, um, you know, while it puts food on the table for me and for my family, it's just a piece of the larger story. And it's a very interesting and, and quickly evolving story about um, how people are capturing and leveraging data for insight in their business and for competitive advantage. Um, and... Um, you know, the, the, to, to sort of connect everything together, all the different types of systems that create data, all the types of systems that consume data, all the different ways you might want to analyze the data, it's not one single thing that does that for you. Um, and, and today what, what people are working towards is um, lots of smaller independent components that are working together in concert to achieve some larger goal. Um, and so you see that, uh, so these two trends that we were just talking about um, in, in terms of uh, streaming technologies, um, I, I've been spending a fair bit of time looking at Kafka, for example, where you know, the, connecting different systems and uh, reliably moving the data between those systems, conditionally moving it in, from you know, in one place to another based on certain rules, um, even giving you some insight into the data maybe before it, it lands in any kind of database, I think is really interesting. And you said that was a LinkedIn-based project originally. Is that right? Right. Apache Kafka began at, at LinkedIn, okay. um, and there's some folks who've left it are now out commercializing the project. And you know some of those people, so you've been chatting with yeah, them. Yeah. I mean, one of the nice yeah. things about being here in Palo Alto is you sort of run into people at coffee shops, and yeah. they're literally around the corner from us. And, and so why, does, why is this a big deal? Well, I think um, it's it's pretty early, um, mm -hmm. but I think uh, the people uh, have really come to re organizations have really come to realize that that their their perspective on their data is not in one system, mm -hmm. and it's not uh, a, a frozen point in time. It's moving quickly, and 
um, a, an important piece of that puzzle is the infrastructure that connects all the different systems and facilitates the movement of the data between all those different systems. Mm. So is part of the implications there that organizations might be making flawed decisions because in in this moment in time they don't have that stream currently working? Or is yeah, that or that or, or that um, uh, the the time it takes to move the data is so long that the opportunity for insight disappears. Mm -hmm. And so by putting this infrastructure in place that allows you to more reliably and more quickly move data, you're putting yourself in a position to to have a you know faster time to insight around what's happening in your business. Right, because in some situations when data is a week old, it's no longer going to help you. I, it's uh, we're we're well past the week. Now we're talking about you know tens of milliseconds being the threshold at which data starts to lose right. its value. <laughs> Well, certainly in industries like threat detection, you yep. can you can see why that would be high a problem. frequency trading, threat detection, fraud yeah. detection, uh, recommendation engines. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's you know uh, increasingly different kinds of use cases where time is really of the essence, but you're also not able necessarily to address the needs of an application through one single technology and one system. It's a lot yeah. of things working together to make it happen. So there's a data integration issue that's a daunting part of that problem because you might be dealing with someone who's touching parts of your system that are not connected. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, I think data integration is is one way people people think about it. Um, the way sort of the emerging trend um, I, is just more streaming analytics and people getting a closer look to the data um, as you know as close to when it's born as possible do you think we could apply kafka tomorrow to solve the lost luggage issue with airplanes because <laughs> that's one example where a week later is really shitty uh, haven't you learned to not check your bags <laughs> no it's a good point it is a good point but sometimes they check it at the gate i don't know if you've ever been through that hell but anyhow uh moving on um so Talk to me about graph databases. There's a lot of sex appeal around this. Do you think this is hype or do you think graph databases have a new uh, dimension of value to offer people? I think it's very interesting. Um, I think there is some hype, um, but it, uh, but I think there's a lot there. Uh, and frankly, I found, I mean, the, the learning curve on the graph, uh, graph model and graph queries and using these systems is fairly steep. Um, yeah. But people, once you get into it, I think it's, uh, it's, it's extremely powerful, some of the things you can do. Um, and there's a, certainly a place, and, but we, we've started to view graph as um, fairly, uh, fairly narrow in its applicability, just sort of looking at the broad database landscape. And we've, we view it as something we'd like to see as a capability of MongoDB. Um, mm -hmm. That you know, we're not going to rewrite the database as a graph database, but we can give graph operators and um, certain new types of indexes that will allow you to get most of the way there. Um, and this is, you know, this is not us just being in an ivory tower. We're hearing enough from users um, uh, in different sorts of industries, like healthcare, where the analytics you can perform with these um, graph models gives you some capabilities you really just can't get otherwise. Yeah. So. Maybe you have an example of how that could work, hypothetical at least, like how can graph make a difference that you couldn't get from a document? Um, so uh, fundamentally, you would still model the data in documents because we mm -hmm. view document as sort of the superset of all these different um, underlying data models, including relational. But um, the, with the right indexes and operators, you can you can use it like you would think about using a graph database. So. Um, you know, there's a couple of different examples in, uh, maybe the one that's most uh, obvious uh, is for industries like telcos where you, the, your core assets are networked things. You think about it, you know, the, mm. the network that, um, that a telco manages and operates, being able to inter uh, interrogate uh, and ask questions about that network through, through this sort of an approach gives you a, a way to do things like, um, uh, put the right advertisements in front of uh, your customers at the right time or mm -hmm. find uh, opportunities to more efficiently stand up cell towers for better coverage or um, uh, understand where you maybe have uh, over density or insufficient density coverage uh, in certain places. Um, that's a sort of physical network topology, mm -hmm. but there are also relationship networks 
in terms of people in term in healthcare in terms of mm-hmm. um, drugs and how they relate to certain ailments and being able to infer new sorts of treatments based on data that you already know. Right. And, and sounds like there's a visual element that comes into play sometimes too, right? To be able to visualize data in ways that you might not pick up on if you were just crunching numbers. I think that is uh, absolutely the case that, that um, uh, there's a really interesting opportunity and you see this in some of the demonstrations and applications people build where you're, you're, you're look, you know, you're not looking at data in a simple, you know, spreadsheet type report. Uh, you're, mm-hmm. you're looking at these rich sort of interlinked data structures and you're able to explore them visually, uh, almost like you're in a game or something like that. So breaking news, MongoDB is going to become a graph database and John Reed gets the story. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, to your point, it, it, while you're not abandoning what you're doing, you're, you're also saying that document Based databases have become very well established, and you're evolving with with the landscape and the times. Is that basically what you're trying to get across? Yeah, I mean, I think what most most organizations don't, you know, they want to standardize on a relatively small portfolio of technologies, right? And I think we're we're safely in an era now where it's not, you know, one database for all things. But it's also not 20 databases that I'm going to use. It's like I need a couple of different things, and that gets me you know, pretty much everything I need. And right. so we need to continue to push the envelope on what you can do with MongoDB. And we think we're in a, you know, we think we're in a great place. Um, uh, and Graph is, you know, a really is an important part of what we're going to do in the future. And the one other piece you and I were talking about before I hit the record button was the impact of containers. How do you see the container phenomenon sort of uh, provoked by Docker and now other players, how do you see that fitting into this world? Yeah, um, it's been fascinating to watch uh, just how quickly containers have have taken off. Um, and I think the, the lesson is a similar lesson that we learned is that if you give developers the right APIs and the right interfaces, um, they will, you know, they are the kingmakers and they're going to you know, anoint some new technology if you right. have the right, the right experience, the right user experience for the developer. And I think that's what Docker has when you like, well, what's the difference between Docker and VMware or standard virtualization technologies? It's the interface for how you use the technology is designed for people to script, you know, environments into their application build processes. Right. And it's, uh, it's been really interesting to watch. So for us, you know, we, we've been, you know, we're sort of seven, eight years into the project now, and containers didn't exist when we started. Mm-hmm. Um, virtualization was relatively new still, but it's just another way. We want you to be able to run MongoDB anywhere, and containers are the latest um, area that, you know, we need to be able to to uh, accommodate. And right. um, insofar as MongoDB is a distributed system, the the what's interesting and happening in the in the container space now docker has won the sort of container standard debate right the interesting the the uh the the wars right now are the orchestration options for managing all these containers and um mongodb is distributed so right. the the way you run mongodb needs to sort of fit into how you're going to run all these different containers with your orchestration tool uh, and that's an interesting thing that we're working on right now. Yeah, and you also you also mentioned to me that that while <laughs> you know we were talking about the DBN DB engines rankings because you guys are currently number four and there's some rather big players, <laughs> uh, modestly sized players. Yeah, Microsoft, People, yeah. IBM, Oracle. Uh, you guys have kind of won the battles that are a little easier to win there in terms of adoption, but you also were talking about in terms of cloud that you think like in the cloud side that that you really have a lot of room to sort of, I guess, claim or dominate that space. Are you seeing a lot of activity with cloud-based? Oh, it's it's enormous. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's sort of a funny thing. Uh, in all my years in software, you generally knew who was using your product. Like they had to fill out a form to download it or they had to buy it from you or whatever. And today, you know, people download MongoDB over 20,000 times a day just from our website. We don't know what they're doing with it, but we have some insight based on our cloud management tools into, right. into where people are running and what kinds of environments, uh, what sorts of operating systems, machine instance types, all of those good things. And the numbers are are 
just sort of overwhelming in how how much usage there is in the cloud, and it's just you know a a piece of the bigger picture. Yeah. So I've talked about this in the past in terms of data gravity, like that as as organizations move more and more stuff to the cloud, the data gravity in an organization moves towards the cloud, right? As you started to integrate more and more cloud systems together and you have less and less data residing on premise systems, is that, do you think you're kind of seeing that as well, that we're starting to see the sort of shift? Um, I hate answers that begin with it depends, but mm. um, there is a really strong difference between uh, sort of traditional um, Fortune 500 type companies sure. and um, companies that are you know uh, more, more open minded uh, or maybe just newer or maybe they their whole business is in the cloud. Cloud the first native. Place anyway. They yeah. started a cloud native business or. They're, um, they're following the darling footsteps of net net um, Netflix and Amazon and right. such. Yeah, I, but there's there is I mean there is no uh, I I think um, twenty twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen I read this in a Gartner report recently was the first year ever that there was more uh, growth in projects in the cloud than on prem. Right, and that so we've sort of crossed so the Rubicon, that, yeah. and, and we are just increasingly the workload, the pro, the greater proportion of workloads we will be in the cloud. It's irresistible, but there I think will always be some amount of on prem, yeah, yeah, uh, on prem usage. And so what we see is the first place is test and QA. Like I'm designing and prototyping, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I if I can just completely eliminate that whole provisioning step of my project. Hey IT, I need some servers to run my project. Okay, we've really got the, we've really got everything streamlined now. We'll get it should be about 8 weeks and we can have your servers up and ready for you. It's like people people don't tolerate that anymore. You can get in just right. a couple of seconds uh, all the servers I want on AWS or or Azure. So, I I think it's test and dev initially and then it's the new applications where maybe um, you know, there's sort of it's a mobile app or it's something that's more Sort of customer facing and the elasticity properties of the cloud are what's really compelling. Yeah. But there's sort of the traditional stuff, the the ERP systems that yeah. are, you know, they're still running. They mo mostly serve an internal business function, and right. having them in the cloud is is not hugely um, compelling. The other one that you see um, back to your concept of uh, data gravity or, or data inertia is um, the the it's not free uh, or instantaneous to move the data. And so mm -hmm. where you have maybe your traditional data warehouse or these really big systems is where it's like, do I really want to like unplug the hard drives and put them on a truck and drive them to the data center? Because that's the efficient way to move the data. Um, that, that's where you, I still see more on-prem. Right. All right. I wish I had some law and order music like for the rip from the headlines part of this podcast. Dun, 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 dun. <coughs> but... We do have a couple of headlines here involving Mongo and security, which I'm sure you're already familiar with. Uh, and one of them has to do with the Microsoft Careers page, uh, which uh, uh, attackers, black hats, if you will, were able to exploit. Um, and that happened to be running on Mongo. And then we have another headline they hit recently that I thought was interesting for some other reasons that involved 13 million MacKeeper users. Um, exposed after the MongoDB door was left open. And in that case, it talks about how um, there's a ton of different databases, whether it's Cassandra, CouchDB, or Redis, all sort of essentially can be exposed. You talked to me about this earlier, about you got to lock your, your door, which is sort of implied by the headline there. Um, what is your response to all that? Well, I mean, we take seriously, we take, we take seriously, we take security um, very, very seriously. It's it's uh, been a core part of the product um, for a number of years, and in every release that I've been at the company, which is um, you know almost four years now, we have added more and more security features into the product. And this is not um, not just in our our uh, paid version of MongoDB. In the open source version of MongoDB, you have everything you need to secure the system. Um, uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, so what you have in these examples are people that have deployed MongoDB with all the security disabled. And um, you know we, we treat users as adults and you know they have the option of 
enabling or disabling security. Right. Um, and you know, it's, it's security. Uh, I think the analogy is very appropriate in terms of your front door or locking your car. It, it, it's um, having the security on is less convenient. So I think what happens is people turn it off for the sake of convenience and then they just go put these things in the cloud um, and, and forget to turn the security back on. And at most of the data we believe um, is just test data or dummy data where they don't really care. There's really, yeah. you know, the vulnerability is there but they're not concerned about any significant data loss. But certainly case that that's not true for all of these. And some people are not taking precautions that they should be taking. So what we've done is um, made it wide, made, you know, taken all of our best resources in terms of security best practices and put them, put them together in a blog, have other re free resources, educational resources, um, and uh, have tried to get the word out like, look, you know, you should maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, assess your current situation and make sure that right. you have things secured the way, the way they should be. And what I would say to anyone on the podcast, for example, is, you know, think about all the sensitive data on your smartphone. Um, there's a lot. There's more than you, you know, could possibly know in some ways. And if you don't have a passcode on your phone or you're not using the thumbprint or fingerprint reader, right? it's the same thing. You're leaving things wide open to somebody who finds your device. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I also didn't know about this search engine called Shodan, which I wish I knew enough about databases to exploit this search engine because it's pretty fascinating. You can essentially crawl almost any database service connected to the internet that's exposed in any way, which uh, is fodder, I think, for some pretty fascinating stuff if you had some Yeah, it's time. not just databases. It's, you know, yeah. anything that has, uh, that's, that has an IP address, Yeah, uh, they're able to, you know, they basically crawl all of that and process it and give you some interesting capabilities. That's it's a, it's crazy. A cool resource. So one of the things that in their blog post about this, what, and they've been, you know, really supportive and we've engaged with them on a number of occasions is like, look, you know, the, the tens or hundreds of, it's like, it was like a petabyte of data. I remember it was a huge, huge volume of data in aggregate and the tens of thousands of instances that are out there are, a, you know, a small fraction of the total amount of usage of MongoDB and these other technologies that they covered as well. It's like, right. there's, it's hard to imagine just how many servers are running in data centers, running these different pieces of software. And so they wrote about, it's not just MongoDB, it's all these other right. technologies. It's just that MongoDB is the most popular, and so that's the one we chose to talk right. about. Right, yeah, I said like even in this article, it listed a lot of the other NoSQL databases as being essentially subject to the same issue entirely. And I mean, it seems to me that, that the problem with these security things is that they're really important, but a lot of the media that comes out around them is like sensational, like, you know, like Microsoft is on the hot seat now and or and 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 Mongo or whoever it is. And and in reality, security is kind of a shared responsibility, right? Like it would be nice to just say, oh, put it on these three vendors to solve my security issues. But as a customer or as an individual consumer, you have a responsibility. Yeah. And a lot of times when you look at enterprise security breaches, it has to do with either employee uh, who are not up to speed on security protocols or systems that have not been updated and patched uh, to the latest releases, which is a constant problem on personal computers as well. And so unfortunately, as much as we would like to sort of turn this into sensational scapegoating, it's actually, in my opinion, the era we live in. And we all unfortunately have to take some responsibility for that. I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, honestly, in our internal discussions about this, it was, you know, this is unfortunate that these are coming out and they, you know, some people might view this as reflecting negatively on MongoDB. But, but stepping back from that for a moment, awareness is going to go up. And hopefully, as an outcome from this, we have people being more careful about their security uh, in MongoDB and, and other systems as well. Well, and I, I often, I never really view these types of moments as static events, to be honest with you, because my feeling, when I look at issues like this, which are frankly going to happen to every vendor, however responsible or not they are, and I, I look at that in terms of how do you respond to that situation? How, how does it impact your, your future approaches? Are you able to talk transparently about it? Are you able to better educate your customers? Because a lot of it comes down to education, right? And and to me, this is the kind of thing that just shows you that that you, like your customers, are going to have to be vigilant about over-educating on this stuff, you know? Because um, it's out there. Yeah. You know? And it like you said, it's you're never done. It's always no. the threats are evolving. They're growing in volume. 
we now have, you know, I don't want to, you know, get all spooky <laughs> on your listeners, but the number of state sponsored groups who are yeah. employed and, and in- encouraged strongly to do this kind of work is continuing to rise. So, right. Uh, it, it's an ongoing responsibility that, you know, w- will, there will be new roles in large companies created exclusively to work on the problem of securing their systems and their data. Care to take a position on Apple versus the FBI since we're on this topic? Oh, I, well, just on it for me personally, um, I just, it's impossible. It just seems preposterous that you could open the door and close it and it have it never open again. Like, I think what Apple has been asked to do is, you know, uh, I understand the motivation, but I just I think you let, you're letting a genie out of a bottle that you'll never be able to put back in. Right. It seems like the request opens up the possibility of uh, there, there's the way it's been framed. There's no way to just solve it for this phone, right? Like that you would essentially create a a backdoor that would be applicable in many other cases. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be any attempt to try to restrict that. Yeah, I mean, there, there are the details have, have con- sort of evolved, and I'm no expert on Apple hardware um, or the OS. But if we just sort of step back from the specifics of this case to encryption more broadly, of somebody should have the master key, uh, somebody of authority should have the master key. I just I think that's you know that's impossible. It would never work. Right. Well, I guess time will tell. Uh, my my biggest question about it is, will it I, I, I tend to support the Apple side of this to a large extent, but I worry that if they get these decisions to go against them based on political climate and stuff, that it can end up almost causing more harm because then a punitive you know, regulation comes down that prevents the kind of encryption they're trying to accomplish. So I'm not sure what the solution is there. Uh, I keep hoping for some backdoor, backdoor compromise to happen behind the scenes. The, the other interesting thing is like the cloud data. <laughs> Because, you know, the cloud data is, is less secure. And that's sort of gone un, un, undiscussed in this thing. But, you know, the FBI wants the phone, but the cloud data was a lot easier to get access yeah. to. And it's like, I'm not sure that as an individual, you and me should be totally comfortable with that either, you know? Uh, yes. Um, it's the cloud. <laughs> it yeah. must be okay. Uh, but, but, you know, there, there's been plenty... We talk about these security breaches of you know whatever data is in these MongoDB instances, but they're you know it's all kinds of systems, and it's not just in the cloud. It's in big companies, it's in little companies, and um, I don't, security is it's going to be a it is dominant topic for us. Well, Kelly, I interrupted your afternoon where you were planning to have a productive afternoon of writing, so I've really screwed that up for you. But you were. You told me that you were writing on something that you can't talk about, which is super interesting because we can't discuss it. But it pertains to your upcoming MongoDB World Conference in June. You're allowed to say that much, I think. Yeah, it's something that uh, we'll be able to talk a lot more about. Yeah. So, so as we wrap, give us the short version of why someone should show up to MongoDB in June. Well, what so, are they going to do? Yeah, get MongoDB there? World is our annual conference. Um, it, it's a uh, you know, a lot of technology conferences are out here in the Bay Area. There aren't that many that are in New York. Um, this is our home turf. The mothership is, yeah. is there midtown. And um, it's a, a developer-focused conference. So it's uh, lots and lots of deep content from the people who write the database and write the systems around the database. Uh, but it's also presentations from customers talking about, you know, what they're doing with the, with the technology, what's been hard, what's been easy. We okay. don't audit anything. You know, it's like... Everything is out there. Uh, it's two days. Uh, it's you know be between 2,000 2,500 people, um, and uh, it, it's actually a lot of fun and a very very rich, um, worthwhile conference. I think. I I recall going to some standing room only Spark and uh, Docker sessions last year too. So you have some interesting crossover with some of the other stuff that's going on. So like I said, we we fit yeah. into the larger world, and we need to we need to know how all that happens. Are you allowed to reveal the musical guest? Uh, we, you know, the theme of the conference, um, one of the themes of MongoDB is for giant ideas. 
So yeah. we're pretty excited. Drum roll. We're pretty excited to have <laughs> They Might Be Giants uh, playing at the There Cubs. you go. So for some of you, that's going to like be a, uh, like a great, great uh, wave of nostalgia washing over you right now. <laughs> they Might Be Giants. Sounds good. Good luck I've with it. I've been listening to them for at least you know, 25 years. So. Well, there you go. All right. Well, it looks like I'll probably see you in June. Good luck. Thanks. Look forward to it. Take care.